starting now and we're actually um, recording this or streaming this live on Facebook at the same time. So uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we have, I think, looks like 60, the number's going up all the time, participants who are, are with us on the Zoom meeting and there'll be some on Facebook too. Um, so I, just to introduce myself, I'm Dave Webb, uh, Chair of CND and I thank all the participants here, all the panel uh, and the participants for joining us today. Um, as many of you will know, we should have been in New York for this, for the 2020 Review Conference of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is held every five years. Um, but it, and it's hoped that I think uh, the actual Review Conference will, will be held hopefully in around January between 4th and 29th uh, next year, but we don't really know that for certain. Perhaps Aidan will be able to tell us a bit more about that um, when, when it comes to it. So we have um, our panelists today are Jeremy Corbyn, who was uh, until recently the leader of the Labour Party and leader of the opposition, uh, a vice president of CND, and he will talk to us about Trident and the political situation in the UK. Then we have uh, Bill Kidd, who's a member of the Scottish Parliament, uh, an SNP member, Scottish Nationalist Party member, and convener of the cross-party group in the Scottish Parliament on nuclear disarmament. He'll be talking to us about the situation in Scotland. Rebecca Johnson, who's executive director of the Acronym Institute for Dipl Disarmament Diplomacy, and also a vice president of CND and founding president of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN. And she will talk about what Britain would need to do to sign the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And then we also have uh, Ambassador Aidan Little, who is the UK ambassador and UK permanent representative to the Conference on Disarmament since 2018. Uh, and he will be able to say something to us about the NPT and Britain's work on disarmament. So uh, a lot to look forward to. Um, they will all speak for about 10 to 15 minutes each and then we'll have time for questions. You can submit questions either through Facebook if you're on the Facebook, Facebook or you can use the chat facility on Zoom which is at the bottom of your screen. If you move your, your mouse to the bottom of the screen, you'll see a chat come up, you'll be able to enter something there. If you want to raise your hand to speak, then uh, you can do that also through, uh, you first of all have to view the participants list. So you again, move on to the participants icon on the bottom of the screen, click on that. And then at the bottom of that list of participants or panelists, you'll see a little thing that says raise hand. Uh, if you do that, we'll be able to see that you've raised your hand and um, we'll be able to indicate, you know, that indicates you'll want to, to ask a question. So thank you very much um, everybody again and uh, let's get started without further ado. So Jeremy, are we, we're calling on you first to, to speak if, if that's okay. Yes, Dave. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for organising this and thank you for CND for putting this on. I think it's very, very useful and very important. And uh, I want to thank everyone that's participating either by Zoom or on Facebook, because uh, it is important to do that. Now, the conference, uh, NPT review conference that we would all be at at this moment has, of course, been postponed until 2021. And I think we should see this as a way in which we can prepare even better for next year and learn some of the lessons of the present crisis. 191 member states participate in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the highest number of any UN treaty process so far as I'm aware. And at the end of the last review conference in 2015, the declared nuclear weapons states made a rather lengthy statement in which, um, they, with a lot of caveats, they did commit themselves to the principle of the elimination of nuclear weapons ultimately. Now, one may question uh, the sincerity of that in some cases, but nevertheless, <clears throat> it was there. And it was also in response to the General Assembly vote that had been so historic on this. Now, <clears throat> the corona crisis that's on at the moment has um, 
demonstrated a lot of things. One is global indivisibility on issues that affect us all. Climate change obviously affects us all. Pollution obviously affects us all. And the vulnerability of all of us to a global pandemic, many now realize, often for the first time, actually affects everybody. There is no hiding place from it. What it's also shown is the inability of many of the world's health services, because they barely exist, to cope with this crisis. And it is the poorest and most vulnerable people that suffer the most. And even within the richer countries in Europe and in North America, it's black and minority ethnic communities that suffer the most, either in terms of those working in health services or those that die as a result of getting corona. In some cases, they're both um, in both and are in the same situation. And the inability of the World Health Organization, because of its underfunding, to totally deal with this crisis indicates that the world has got to look at things in a different way in the future. And that means properly funding the World Health Organization, not doing what President Trump has done, which is to announce that he's cutting its funding because he didn't like some of the advice it was given. And so I think this is a lesson that we need to learn very, very rapidly and need to use in all our campaigning work up into, until the 2021 review. Now, the general election result in Britain in 2019 was obviously not what I wanted or what I'd campaigned for or what I'd worked for, because I was looking forward to be a participant on behalf of government in the um, review conference that's now taking place. But sadly, that was not to be. But as with all previous general elections in Britain, they're then followed, it's now a tradition, by a strategic defence and security review. And uh, that is now taking place. It's been delayed a little because of the corona crisis, but it is taking place in Britain. And the points that are going to be uh, discussed within the review, and I'll be making a submission to the review, one is UK's role in the world. Second, the problems that we face. Thirdly, the capabilities that Britain has to respond to them. Fourthly, the reforms that are needed. And fifthly, an interesting one, the integration of UK government and diplomatic capabilities on how we deal with these issues. I'm going to be putting forward a substantial submission to the Strategic Defence and Security Review. And the points I'm going to put into it, and I'm working on at the moment, are one, learn the lessons of interdependence in the world and learn that all the military might in the world, all the firepower in the world, all the nuclear weapons in the world, were as of naught compared to the power of a previously unknown and unseen virus to infect hundreds of thousands, well, no, millions of people around the world and lead to the premature deaths of hundreds of thousands of people across the world. And it's not finished yet. And so, Real security comes from the ability to protect each other because we're all vulnerable to the person who is vulnerable themselves to an infection such as coronavirus. Secondly, that the environmental crisis that we're in the midst of is serious. Global warming is happening. Global pollution levels are very, very high the loss of species and habitat and the crossover of human activity into previously um, non-human inhabited wild spaces potentially if not actually leads to the growth and creation of new viri which we're all subject to and but also because of the lockdown and the suspension of a great deal of economic activity and particularly reduction in transport by in urban areas as well as air transport globally as well as shipping globally has meant that many people around the world for the first time have been able to breathe clean air. The pictures from New Delhi of first for the first time in the lives of many people actually being able to see the wonderful Lutyens buildings in New Delhi for the first time other than through fog 
being able to see to the mountains and the Himalayas and the, uh, Indian cities is something that many people are experiencing for the first time. And even here in London, we're able to see stars at night, something that I've hardly ever seen in all the years that I've been living in London. So people have had a bit of a whiff, despite all the horrors and the loss of life from coronavirus and all the stresses that go with it, that we do have to have more respect for our natural world and things are not going to be the same again. The third area is the consequences of the wars that we've already had. The consequences of the war in Afghanistan, the consequences of the war in Iraq have been a very large number of refugees. Refugees living in camps, living in camps in Syria, in Lebanon, living in camps in Turkey and in Libya. And also as a result of the activities of the Myanmar military, a very large number of Rohingya people a million or more living in camps in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh and because they want somewhere decent to live they move on and are trying to live move into Assam and other parts of India. The consequences of the 65 million refugees around the world having nowhere to go um, is huge and they're all human beings that are looking for somewhere secure to live. If there is an economic meltdown post, post Covid as opposed to an investment-led strategy, if it's an economic meltdown on a par with what happened after the financial crisis of 2008, then the number of refugees is going to rise and the tension surrounding rising refugee numbers is going to be huge. So I think these are factors that have to be borne in mind. Also, you have to ask yourself the question about global financial inequality. If Western countries struggle to cope with closing down their economies for months, two months, maybe three months, perhaps even longer, but they can manage it and still survive, more vulnerable economies in the southern part of the world, in Africa, Latin America and South Asia, will really struggle to achieve that. This exposes the unfairness in the world's economic system and the way in which Africa actually subsidizes the rest of the world rather than the other way round. And so that means you then have to have this review and you ask yourself the question, we spend a very large amount of money every year on defense, on the defense budget in Britain. We are also spending money on maintaining the Trident nuclear deterrent and the uh, uh, continuous at sea patrol of it. And uh, Britain is committed to the replacement of the Trident system. And I think you have to say, of all the threats facing us in the world, which one of those threats will nuclear weapons be able to solve? Or will we lead to a process between the big five of rearmament and of growing tensions. The growing tensions between the USA and China, the growing tensions between um, Britain and Russia, to some extent France and Russia, and to some extent the US and Russia, all lead in one direction, which is the idea that somehow or other, a greater level of armament will bring about a greater level of security. I beg to differ. So I hope that in this review, we're able to put forward rational arguments about the real security of people, which comes from their economic security, from their environmental security, from their social security, and a relationship with other countries which does condemn human rights abuses by any state, by Russia, by China, by the USA, by this country, by France, or anybody else that is a policy that's based on respect for human rights and justice around the world. Therefore, the 2021 review ought to be the opportunity when the world can actually recognize what uh, the majority of member states of the United Nations have done, as the, the General Assembly resolution, is to find a way other than holding increasing nuclear weapons as a way of bringing about peace and sustainability in the future, and take at their word the declaration of the permanent members of Security Council that they actually supported a, ultimately a non-nuclear world. So I think we should see this in, amidst all the misery and horrors, which are huge as a result of Corona-19, an opportunity for people to understand 
that if we don't respect the need to depend on each other and stop condemning each other, we'll actually be a better world and in a better place. And that um, in the case of this country, I hope we'll get a strategic defense review which recognizes that real security comes from peace, real security comes from respect for human rights all around the world, and real security is about recognizing the limits of exploitation of the world's natural resources and the need for an industrial revolution, but this time a green industrial revolution based on sustainability. And so our discussion today, I think, could be very, very helpful and framed around these issues. And we have a year in which to get those issues across and build support for it all around the world. Thank you very much for inviting me to take part in today's uh, discussion. I'm really grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. That's a very useful and interesting perspective and context in which we can uh, view uh, everything else, I think. Um, so, uh, Bill, would you like to give us Bill Kidd, uh, uh, the view from Scotland, really, from the Scottish Parliament and from Scotland generally. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Dave. Um, thanks very much uh, also uh, for a good kickoff there, actually, on the discussion from Jeremy. That was very, very, um, very worthwhile. Uh, elements there which I hadn't known too much about uh, coming from Westminster. I think that's very, very worthwhile hearing. Um, I hadn't met Jeremy since I think it was 2014 in Vienna um, and we were at the humanitarian conference, uh, the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons, I think it was, um, and I remember meeting you there, that was, that was um, it didn't seem as long ago as that, but there you go. Um, so, thanks also, to, sorry Jeremy, were you going to say something? <laughs> Sorry, um, thanks very much to CND UK anyway for inviting me to join in with this event today. It's, it's extremely important um, that we get a broad range of views and standpoints. I'm going to be speaking um, mostly um, about the circumstances as they pertain in Scotland, but also on an international basis with nuclear weapons. Um, we'd obviously all have preferred to have been able to take part in our deliberations at UNHQ, um, although I have to say that the weather here in Scotland is a bit nicer than it is in New York at the moment from what I've been checking out. Um, so, um, but I'll address the need which we're all agreed on, uh, I know, to see an end to nuclear weapons across the world and why we have to look to start this by getting rid of them at home. I think that's very important for those of us who live in nuclear weapon states, we have to take responsibility um, for starting the process, um, uh, or at least kicking the process uh, into gear. Uh, the NPT, um, which uh, we'd have been over in New York about, the NPT Non-Proliferation Treaty is 50 years old now, and uh, just about reaching the venerable stage, but in this instance, venerable is not a good thing uh, to be and what we're seeing is a cosy club mentality where nuclear weapon states regularly furrow their brows about how they're carrying the nuclear burden for the world. You know, they, it's not their fault. They're just, they're doing it and they're making sure that nobody else does it to the best of their abilities because, uh, well, to be honest, they don't want anybody else uh, joining the cosy club that they're part of. Um, their mouths are full of salt from the crocodile tears that they're crying. They're, all the time they're spending hundreds of billions of dollars, pounds, rubles, euros, and renminbi. And renminbi is the Chinese uh, uh, currency, which I had to look up, I have to say, but they're spending them. And they're doing this whilst the climate goes to hell and babies are bombed or starved to death in Yemen or Syria. Uh, so it was a beam of light that came into this darkness with the passing of the Nuclear Weapons Prohibition Treaty at the UN in 2017. And it proved to be so in tune with the ambitions of so many nations. And um, I attended the conference. I, uh, I was delighted to be there. I was delighted with the result, obviously. And whilst I was there, I was honored <clears throat> to present a letter of support for the success of the gathering from Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, MSP, to the conference chair, Ambassador Elaine White Gomez of Costa Rica. The core message of the letter was a wish that the nations gathered would have the will to do 
and the soul to dare. And I'm proud that those nations who voted demonstrated that they have both. Uh, during the conference vote, it was noted for, um, by many that the UK delegation, along with the delegations from the other members of the nuclear club, weren't present. So I went and sat in the UK space um, at their seats, and, and uh, sadly, not all of them, not quite that bill, uh, but I sat in their space, and sadly, uh, that didn't allow me representing Scotland there to cast a vote in favour of the treaty, but as a UK delegation should have been there to represent all views, I felt it legitimate in taking that seat. And the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament have voted twice to bring the Trident presence at its site of less than 30 miles from the city of Glasgow to an end in Scotland. <clears throat> the ruling SNP group, the Scottish Greens, and a number of Scottish Labour MSPs have been steadfast in representing the settled will of the Scottish people that the nuclear weapons around here on the Clyde have no place in Scotland's lands or waters. However, uh, we as yet, as it's known, lack the powers of a sovereign state, and for now at least, Westminster decides our nuclear fate. In 2012, <clears throat> I attended a conference in Kazakhstan, and um, whilst there, I asked the Kazakh ambassador to the UN, um, who was speaking at the conference, and how Kazakhstan uh, decided when it became independent from the Soviet Union that it did not want to be the fourth largest nuclear power in the world and it wanted the nuclear weapons removed. Um, so I asked him um, how that had gone, how that had been handled and how they made um, sure that a country with semi palatin skin it where um, the, the world's biggest nuclear test site, uh, resulting in one and a half to two million people in Kazakhstan with genetic damage because of these nuclear tests. How did they get these weapons taken out of Kazakhstan? And he told me that Russia had taken all of those weapons back to their own soil and that the USA had paid for the cleanup. So you see the cooperation there again of the nuclear club um, they can cooperate with each other when it suits, um, but when it doesn't suit, they threaten the rest of us with annihilation. <clears throat> well, I asked how long this had taken, uh, considering how large <clears throat> pardon me, an arsenal there had been there, and I was told that it had taken four years to have as quick and safe a procedure of removal of all those nuclear weapons as was possible. And uh, the ambassador estimated that in Scotland, two to three years should see that quick and safe procedure as required in our circumstances. And then we came to the question, or we come to the question, of the numbers of those employed at Fasley and Coolport Base, because I think it's very important that we remember that we're, we're talking about something which people have an attachment to um, because it provides employment, we're told, and also it provides safety for communities, not only because it stops other countries from attacking you, but also because it is something which provides good quality living um, for those people who live in the area where nuclear bases are. Well, the question of the numbers of those employed at Fasley and Coolport Base, um, there's been significant cooperation between Scottish CND and the STUC in investigating the issue of both the defence and renewable industry jobs following the removal of Trident from Fasley and Coolport on the Clyde. And two acclaimed joint reports outlined the employment options which would be available with the removal of Trident and the submarines. And these are, or there are, uh, depending on which uh, pro-nuclear uh, political voice you listen to and what day of the week it happens to be, between 5,600 and 11,000 jobs dependent on Trident remaining being based in Scotland. Whereas, in fact, according to the MOD zone figures, there are 524 <clears throat> jobs specifically working on the submarine fleet. Well, let's not forget that the MOD zone figures also tell us that Trident renewal will run to 205 
billion pounds. <clears throat> That's a lot of money for that specific number of jobs when conventional naval work and new renewable jobs would employ thousands, literally thousands in the area and across Scotland and out with Scotland. And Westminster has shown no signs of interest in leaving the big boys toys club on the Security Council at the UN. <clears throat> but with an independent Scotland closing the nuclear submarine base down and having tried and removed it has been shown that there is no other venue on these islands which could operationally host Britain's nuclear arsenal. <clears throat> there is and will be nowhere to go, and Westminster will be forced to abandon the nuclear pretensions of empire which it still clings to. That would mean there will be one fewer in the P5, and that can only be seen as a benefit to our shared world. Now, not everybody is going to agree with the political standpoint of independence for Scotland and not everybody is going to agree even that we should get rid of nuclear weapons. But the reality is that if we do want rid of nuclear weapons, one of the most hopeful moves might be that Scotland becomes an independent state, in which case when we have those nuclear weapons removed, as is the will of the people and of the parliament in which I'm sitting at the moment, the majority of representatives on two votes have actually said that they want this to happen, then I think um, we shouldn't write off the idea that politically Westminster is thrilled. It loves the idea of nuclear weapons and they have to be forced into a position of giving those up. So thank you very much. If there are any questions about that, we're perfectly happy. Uh, I do have to go possibly in about um, three quarters of an hour to go and vote. But other than that, um, I'm very happy with this uh, event today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> um, and so we'll, we'll move on quickly to Rebecca uh, from the Acronym Institute and uh, over to you, Rebecca. Yes, thank you. So first, I want to recognize that the COVID-19 humanitarian disaster has, according to official tested numbers, infected over three million and killed nearly a quarter of a million people in some 210 countries around the world. Let's remember them. As my friend from Hiroshima, Setako Furlow, always reminded us when she talked about that bright, hot morning on August the 6th, 1945, when most of her school friends were incinerated by the atomic bomb codenamed Little Boy. Each and every one of them has a name and people who love them deeply. Well, here we are locked down in our homes and apartments as family members, neighbours and friends struggle and some die. Our daily lives have utterly changed. With anxiety we sign our emails, keep safe and well, especially to friends who work in the health and care services. These are the sheroes and heroes we applaud now, the ones on the front line who do everything they can to make us well and keep us safe. We hear these war metaphors abounding, but they are misleading. This is, this is not a war with an enemy you can defeat with guns or bombs or fighter jets. The defenses we need to tackle and we hope manage and limit COVID-19 are the PPE, the personal protective equipment, the skills and the dedication of our nurses, doctors, scientists, and all those poorly paid women who feed and care for millions of vulnerable people. The military, industrial, bureaucratic, academic, and diplomatic establishments are struggling to keep up. People want security now more than ever but not the nuclear weapons, fighter jets, submarines, tanks, war games, and magic realist shibboleths of nuclear deterrence that dominated the 20th century in the first part of this one and wasted trillions of dollars and as um, 
Bill said, pounds, rubles, euros, you name them. The 2020 NPT review conference has been postponed, maybe to January, maybe longer. So why then are we even talking about nuclear weapons today? Because over 13,000 nuclear weapons constitute an ever-present risk to our human and environmental security. Deployed by nine nuclear armed states on the territories of at least 14 nations, including the UK, of course, these weapons of massive annihilation continue to put the whole world at risk. Analyses from Chatham House, Global Zero and ICANN and others show that nuclear weapons are more likely to be launched by mistake than military intention. Same could be perhaps said of COVID-19, but that doesn't change the destruction they cause and the lives cut short. So what does the UK need to do to prepare for and sign the TPNW? First, wake up and recognize that the nuclear age has been a dangerous and expensive exercise in looking in the wrong direction as far as our security is concerned. Stop living in the romanticized past of British Empire and victorious little England of World War I, World War II, and still punching above our weight. Nuclear weapons are not a status symbol, but a weapon of mass annihilation that could go badly wrong at any moment. It is a security risk and foolishly maintained threat neither a credible deterrent nor an asset. So forget the ridiculous dichotomies pebble, peddled by politicians who cast as opposites unilateral versus multilateral disarmament, national versus international defense and security, and the NPT versus the, TW, the, 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 the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. In real life and security, these aren't either or, but both. We need these approaches to dynamically reinforce each other. Security risks, risk assessments and humanitarian concerns woke up many governments to achieve the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. British people are way ahead of our government in this regard, and particularly in Scotland. So take the TPNW seriously is the next step that has to be taken and begin making preparations for when it will enter into force. It is a multilaterally negotiated UN treaty that the UK could greatly benefit from if it were not so, if our government were not so tied into the perceived status and political value it attaches to nuclear weapons. So here's how. The TPNW has clear verifiable prohibitions and obligations, as well as practical and adaptable op options for all nuclear armed states to join with due recognition that one size doesn't fit all. Negotiated in the context of international humanitarian law, it will apply in peace, wartime as well as peace. It builds on much of the NPT based regime and was designed to plug most, if not all of the NPTs of significant gaps, particularly on disarmament. It shares the purpose of the NPT to avert the danger of nuclear war and puts prevention of nuclear use at the core of its objectives and prohibitions. Article one explicitly prohibits using and threatening to use nuclear weapons. To this end, it also bans relevant activities such as acquiring, producing, possessing, testing, deployment and stationing nuclear weapons, which are precursors for nuclear acquisition threats and use. Now, there's not time to go into all the details, but I want to draw attention to two or three. It has in uh, articles two to five, the practicalities of eliminating nuclear weapons. And it identifies that states can either sign and join, or they can uh, start the process of, of, of negotiating on eliminating. Um, sorry, they can sign or join or join and sign. And I think I'll, because of, of time, I'll, I'll move forward quite quickly on this. Useful steps the UK could begin with. Echoing my question to Ambassador Little in the, in the uh, session earlier by Wilf, fully de-alert Trident and immediately end continuous at sea deployments. CASD is neither necessary nor useful for deterrence. 
ramp up the resources the UK is putting into verifying nuclear disarmament in all its aspects. We commend that the UK has been doing this at Aldermaston since the year 2000, but it needs to be far, far more. Think through what new or adapted facilities UK will need for irreversibly eliminating nuclear weapons as safety, safely and securely as possible, including the health and safety needs of the workforce, environmental and safety during processes, such as returning the warheads from Scotland to AWE, Aldermaston and Burfield, which are down in England near London, for dismantling. They have to travel by road at the moment, uh, that is a very dangerous process, it needs to be thought through, and also the handling and disposing of the nuclear and toxic materials as the warheads are dismantled. Equip the atomic weapons establishment and the UK military, industrial, political, bureaucratic, and where appropriate, diplomatic and academic establishment to put in place what is needed. If necessary, make agreements with Scotland to continue using cool port storage facilities for the time being, but only to store the warheads pending their transport south for dismantlement. Importantly, start developing an internal UK plan for the set steps and requirements. The UK can choose whether it signs first and then negotiates with the state's parties or whether it eliminates British nuclear weapons under our own national responsibility and then signs, ratifies and brings in the TPNW verifiers. But the first step in that identified in the treaty is to take new UK nuclear weapons, well, to, for each country that, that approaches that is either nuclear armed or uh, hosts nuclear weapons, those weapons have to be taken completely out of deployment. For the UK, that means taking the submarines back to Faz Lane, getting those missiles uh, off the submarines, getting the warheads off the missiles, returning the missiles to the United States and storing as safely as possible um, uh, in, in somewhere like a, a cool port. And I think that probably is the only base. Shift security policies and alliances, this is what others have talked about, to non-nuclear defensive defense for addressing real security threats, such as climate chaos, pandemics, current and future weapons, weapons of mass destruction, threats including extremist terroristic violence, i.e. we need a, new, a green new deal for security, peace and defense. So to conclude, with over, uh, uh, with over 100 and, uh, sorry, with over 80 signatories and 36 states parties, the TPNW is on track to take legal effect in 20, 20 or at least it was, probably it's going to be 2021 because of the priorities of governments with regard to the coronavirus. As entry into force nears, as more states join during and after entry into force, work on the treaty will focus both on implementing particularly the humanitarian issues of remediation and preventing nuclear war and nuclear use, and more and more also in the nuclear endorsing nuclear armed states um, and on the implementation institutional issues and compliance in all their, their aspects. COVID-19 is proving to be a personal tragedy for so many, but it also has to be seen as a wake up call. Looking forward, we've got to recognize that the only security approach that matters is the humanitarian, environmental, cooperative security that CND, ICANN, Extinction Rebellion, and the young people striking for climate justice have been so active in, de de in demanding. Nuclear weapons are in the way. We have to seize the opportunity now to get rid of them so that we can really work together on humanitarian security, disarmament, and people-centered defense. Only in that way can we survive by working together. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for that wonderful, powerful message. Um, and uh, basically an introduction to the uh, TPNW um, and what we can do about joining it. So our final panelist member is Ambassador Aidan Little. He's the, as I mentioned before, UK Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the UK to a Congress on Disarmament. Uh, and he's been working on NPT and Britain's work 
on, on disarmament um, for at least two years anyway, uh, probably more. So over to you now, Aidan. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Dave, and, and it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, like others have said, it's a pity we're not doing this in person in New York in the middle of a, of a Revcon, um, uh, but, uh, but never mind. It, it, it's good that we're doing this and keeping up the conversation even, uh, e even while the, the formal processes are suspended. Um, but as others have said, we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to convene the Revcon in January. Um, uh, obviously, there'll, there'll be plenty to... Um, uh, Plenty needs to be decided in terms of uh, whether the pandemic is under control by then and uh, all, that, all that sort of thing. But the, the, um, the target date at the moment at least is January and we very much hope to be um, in a position to do that. Um, so, um, yeah, it's great, great that we're doing this and thank you very much um, to, uh, to CND for convening this and indeed for the uh, invitation to, uh, to put the other view, uh, I think it might be said. Um, I very much admire the, uh, the direct question put in the title of this, uh, of this event, Will uh, Britain Honour Its NPT Commitments and Disarm? Um, and at the risk of sounding a bit like St Augustine of Hippo, the answer is yes, but perhaps not yet. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about, uh, about why, why that is. Um, but I think the first point uh, to discuss is what exactly are the UK's commitments? Um, now, the NPT is... Uh, unique and special for many reasons, but one of those reasons is because it remains the only legally binding commitment on behalf of the nuclear weapon states, or at least the five that are party to the NPT, uh, to pursue nuclear disarmament. And that commitment, uh, that obligation, is enshrined in Article 6. Uh, and it's worth just reminding ourselves exactly what Article 6 says, and I quote, each of the parties to the treaty undertakes to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament, and on a treaty on general and complete disarmament under strict and effective international control. That is the UK's legal obligation under the NPT. Um, we've also, of course, assumed various commitments over the, uh, over the review uh, conferences that have, uh, uh, that have um, uh, reviewed the implementation of the treaty over the last 50 years. Um, Several NPT review conferences, but by no means all, have adopted consensus recommendations and conclusions. Um, notably, of course, the decision to extend the treaty indefinitely in 1995, which also included a decision on uh, principles and objectives of nuclear disarmament. Then, of course, in 2000, the review conference uh, adopted what were known as the 13 practical steps uh, on nuclear disarmament as part of, a, a part of its consensus outcome document. Uh, and in 2010, the parties weren't able to agree a comprehensive consensus outcome document, but they did agree uh, what was known as the action plan, which contains 64 uh, points uh, ranging across all three pillars of the treaty, not just disarmament, but also on peaceful uses and on non-proliferation. Um, those commitments are, are, are valid. Um, they, uh, they remain important. And the UK has been very transparent in how we've pursued those commitments over the years. Um, uh, the, the, the most recent uh, update on that is contained in our draft national implementation report that we tabled at last year's PrepCom uh, and when the RevCon uh, eventually convenes we will table the final uh, version of that implementation report so uh, everybody can see um, what we have done uh, on, those, uh, on those measures. So um, we have a legal obligation and we have various commitments that we've assumed over the years. Um, those commitments are to pursue nuclear disarmament. Um, uh, nuclear disarmament is a process, it's not an event, um, and the UK has engaged in that process over the last 50 years and beyond of that, uh, last 50 years of that treaty and beyond. Um, we've taken various unilateral measures. Um, as Rebecca said, this is, this is uh, something we can pursue unilaterally, bilaterally, plurilaterally and multilaterally and we've done we've done various things but they, they all have to feed off each other as indeed as Rebecca said. Um, so we've, we've taken various uh, measures ourselves we've adopted a minimum credible uh, deterrent stance um, and I can say a bit more about what exactly that means. Um, we've ceased nuclear testing, uh, we've obviously signed and uh, ratified the comprehensive test ban treaty, uh, we've ceased the production of fissile material for nuclear weapons, uh, we've decreased our nuclear weapon stockpiles. Um, the latest uh, Security Defence Review talks about uh, a stockpile of no more than 180. Uh, we've dismantled the, uh, the low yield warhead that we maintained for many years. Now our only uh, warhead
said, is, is that on the Trident uh, missiles on the submarines. We've scrapped the air-delivered uh, nuclear weapons that uh, those low-yield warheads were part of. Uh, we no longer have uh, a, an air-based nuclear system. We only have one delivery system, the Trident submarines. We're the only country of the P-5, uh, the nuclear weapon states, to have uh, reduced our delivery systems to just one. Uh, those nuclear weapons are target, detargeted and de-alerted since 1994. Uh, our nuclear weapons are at several days notice to fire, not several hours as they were in the Cold War. Um, they are um, detargeted, they're not targeted at any state. Um, and that adds up to what we call a minimum credible deterrence. Deterrence needs to be credible, of course, which is why we maintain the continuous at sea deterrent uh, that Rebecca mentioned. Um, because they need to be credible uh, in, in deterring threats that we face. But it is the minimum level that we think is, 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 is credible, calibrated against those threats. And in, in terms of a nuclear deterrent, it is rock bottom. The next step from here is zero, is to not have a nuclear deterrent at all. So why not take that step, um, is the obvious question. Um, the simple answer is that step can't be taken in isolation. It needs to be taken multilaterally. As, as others have mentioned, these, these issues are not solely in the gift of one state. They depend on others. Um, and, and so we need to take that step, step multilaterally. Um, the current situation is not conducive for taking that step multilaterally. Um, uh, obviously, we still face... Uh, we still face threats of further proliferation. Uh, we can see what's happening in DPRK. We're obviously still worried about the situation in Iran uh, and, and others. Though, thanks to the NPT, the, the threat of proliferation is lower uh, now um, than it has been at many other times uh, through the treaty's life, and that's to be celebrated. Um, we still face threats that can only be really deterred by, by nuclear weapons. We certainly can't rule out um, those threats. Jeremy said earlier that there are lots of other threats to uh, people's uh, human security, and he's absolutely right about that. Um, previous uh, uh, security and defense reviews, national security strategies have recognized that, including the threats of pandemics, um, but also climate change uh, and, uh, and other, and other um, security threats. And as he said, real security comes from peace. That's absolutely right. In the British government's view, it is the nuclear deterrent which is the ultimate guarantee of our security and of peace. Um, conventional warfare managed to kill 80 million people in two world wars uh, in the 20th century and many more besides. Um, it's nuclear deterrence, in our view, that is designed to stop great power competition escalating to that sort of level again. Uh, in that sense, nuclear deterrence uh, contributes to peace and is, uh, is, is, the, is the ultimate guarantee of our national independence, security and peace and that of our allies. Because again, this is not just the UK on its own. Uh, the UK's nuclear deterrence is, at, uh, is, is, is part of NATO's overall posture for, uh, for guaranteeing peace and security uh, in the North Atlantic. Um, what we are doing, though, is working to bring that step closer. Um, we're committed to it. Um, as I've, I've mentioned already, um, ceasing production of fissile material and, and stopping nuclear testing. Um, there is a comprehensive test ban treaty which we were instrumental in, uh, in bringing into uh, to fruition. We've ratified it. Uh, we continue to work very hard for its entry into force. We uh, spend a lot of time and effort and money um, building up the capabilities of the provisional uh, um, CTBT organization and its provisional te technical secretariat. Uh, and we, uh, we, 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 we've, uh, we've been one of its key supporters in, in making sure that network of uh, uh, um, stations to detect uh, covert nuclear testing is, 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 is functioning and, uh, and, and reliable. Um, as I say, we, we have a unilateral mor moratorium on the production of fissile material for nuclear uh, weapons. Um, we're working very hard uh, to um, multilateralize that step because that's a key step in bringing that multilateral um, step closer. Um, under our presidency of the conference on disarmament last year, we had a proposal to um, set up a, um, a subsidiary body uh, to, to look at uh, how to bring an FMCT closer. Um, we want to, we're, we, we are ready to begin negotiations on that forthwith. Um, we're not the blockers on that, um, but um, and we're working very hard to try and to try and move that step forward. Um, uh, Rebecca already mentioned verification, and uh, we, as, as, uh, as she said, we, we've done a lot of work um, at a technical and political level over the last few years to uh, 
to, to develop techniques for verifying nuclear disarmament. Um, I, I mentioned the 1995 principles and objectives of nuclear disarmament agreement earlier. It's recognized in that and in subsequent agreements that any nuclear um, disarmament uh, has to be has to be verifiable, has to be credible. We have to be able to verify the absence of nuclear weapons and verify that nuclear armed states have taken that, uh, taken that step. Um, we, we, we've seen with the Chemical Weapons Convention how important that is. Uh, we thought that uh, states, had declared, uh, states that had declared the um, destruction of their chemical weapon stockpiles had done so. It turns out in at least two cases uh, not to have been the case. We cannot afford to make that mistake with nuclear weapons when we, uh, when we disarm. That's why verification is so important and that's why we, we put a lot into it. Although, as Rebecca says, there's always more we could, we could do. Um, uh, we also have been working in uh, amongst the nuclear weapon states, the, the five nuclear weapon states, uh, to try and um, uh, have a more ambitious uh, contribution from them to the uh, to the to the MPT process. Um, Bill Kidd calls it a, a, a cosy club. Um, it's 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 anything but. I can tell you, uh, I've been in uh, several of those meetings, and they're not uh, cosy in the least. Um, but it's, uh, it, 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 but it's an important group. Um, we are all united by one thing, which is that we are the recognized nuclear weapon states under the NPT, and we all have that common responsibility to disarm. Um, it's, uh, it's something that we, uh, the, 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 this process, P5 process, was something that UK set up um, uh, in, uh, in, in the run-up to the uh, 2010 review conference. Uh, it's something that we've championed ever since, and we, uh, we, we have been the coordinator of that process for the last year, uh, running up to what we thought would be the, the RevCon. Uh, and we've worked very hard to push the ambition of that process to, to make a meaningful contribution, particularly in the areas of uh, of strategic risk reduction and, uh, and, and mutual understanding of nuclear doctrines to, uh, to try and uh, enhance trust and confidence, which um, is, is an important step. Um, but I can say more about that if, if, if people are interested. Um, I should also at this stage just correct Bill on one thing. He, he, he conflated um, uh, being one of the recognized nuclear weapon states under the NPT with being the permanent five members of the Security Council. Um, it happens to be the same five countries, but of course the Security Council uh, and the Atlantic Charter was set up way before uh, several of those countries uh, tested nuclear weapons. So uh, um, it, it's important not to not to conflate the two because that only en enhances the, uh, uh, the 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 paradigm around status, which I, I don't, which I, I think we reject. Um, uh, but but is is obviously quite a common trope, uh, as Bill uh, as Bill repeated. Um, uh, there's plenty more there we can go into in discussion, but I, I would just end by saying that we, we remain committed to the total elimination of nuclear weapons under strict and effective international control with undiminished security for all. That is our obligation. That is the commitment we have undertaken. Uh, we continue to work towards that goal uh, and we will do everything within the NPT to bring that day closer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aidan. Thanks a lot. Um, so, uh, that's, that's great, some really interesting and useful information, I think, from all the panelists, but uh, uh, in particular from, um, well, from all of them. Uh, I won't pick out any particular person. Uh, so <clears throat> now this is the difficult part, because I have to negotiate uh, these different questions coming in from different angles. So, um, and some of them are aimed at specific people, others are aimed at the panel. So uh, here's one that was submitted by Thomas Pitt from Cardiff. Um, he says, most of us would agree that the non-proliferation treaty has played an important role in preventing a large number of states from acquiring nuclear weapons over the past 50 years. However, given the limited steps taken by nuclear arms states towards disarmament, coupled with the fact that the treaty has sometimes been disingenuously misinterpreted by the five nuclear weapon states to justify their continued nuclear programs and undermine <clears throat> multilateral negotiations, does the NPT remain a useful vehicle for nuclear disarmament? Um, so uh, anybody want specific want to tackle that or shall I ask someone to tackle that one? Bill, okay, go ahead, Bill. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Dave, and uh, thanks for the question. Uh, as far as I um, believe, in terms of what I've seen uh, in attending um, NPT uh, prep comms and revcon, 
Um, I believe that they do provide a fantastic opportunity for nations who are not in favour of nuclear weapons, whether proliferation or continuation, um, to cooperate, meet with each other, listen to debate, cooperate, um, and also an opportunity for NGOs to take part, um, come from across the world and actually put viewpoints which wouldn't otherwise be able to, um, to easily reach the general public and uh, reach parliamentarians and governments. So I think the NPT does serve a function, but it does have to uh, look to its laurels with the Treaty on Prohibition coming along the NPT really has to up its game if it wants to continue too far into the future. Thanks, thanks Bill. Uh, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, I see it a little differently. I, having actually attended every NPT meeting since 1994, um, the TPNW was clearly intended and indeed did build on much of the non-proliferation and disarmament regime that has its roots and its basis in the 1968 NPT. And we should never forget that or try to dismiss that. These are, as I, I think I, I, I mentioned, these are not sort of, you don't discard uh, an existing treaty that has validity and such an enormous uh, membership as 191 countries, you build on it in order to plug the legal and the technical and the verification gaps because it wasn't possible to do the kind of treaty that we actually need to control, eliminate um, nuclear weapons and prevent nuclear use. The NPT couldn't do that in the Cold War in the 1960s. So the NPT and the TPNW are part of the same regime, it's just as the CTBT is, just as a fissile material production ban would be if we'd ever get one, just as certain other kinds of, um, uh, you know, there, there are a whole lot of different kinds of mechanisms to deal with different aspects of preventing proliferation and getting rid of nuclear weapons, and all of those are needed. Thanks, Rebecca. I think uh, Aidan and Jeremy have indicated. Shall we have Aidan first? Um, sure, I, I can be brief because I actually I, I agree with a lot of what Rebecca said. I mean, we have different views about whether the TPNW is uh, is a, a natural excrescence of uh, the NPT Article 6 or not. Um, she believes it is and uh, my government believes it isn't. But I think the point is uh, the point is 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 absolutely right that all of these things this is a this is a, a, a sort of framework you know all of these things have to build on on each other um, and I think uh, I'm, I'm a bit worried to hear Bill um, saying that the NPT is val is, is valuable mainly as a sort of place for people to come and meet and talk I mean it is valuable for that but actually the real value in the NPT is that 191 states have taken on a legal obligation to control the spread of nuclear weapons, uh, to share peaceful, the peaceful benefits of nuclear technology safely and securely, and for those five states that possess nuclear weapons to eliminate them uh, in a strict and effective uh, international control and with security for all, as I've said. But you know, th th that is the only legal obligation there is. And I think if we, if we throw the baby out with the bathwater and dismiss the NPT, then actually you're, you're, you're starting again from scratch. And, um, it, I sometimes think it was a miracle that the NPT was negotiated at all in 1968. Um, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be negotiable today. So I think we have to we have to cherish what we have. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aidan. And Jeremy, on to you. Uh, following that last point Aidan made, I think it's a very strong one. Uh, looking back and reading through some of the stuff in the 1960s, it's all the more extraordinary it was negotiated at all, because this was the height of the Cold War. This was the time of Prague and so on. It was uh, quite surprising that there was an agreement on, um, on uh, getting a nuclear non-proliferation treaty. So in answer to um, the question, yes, I think it is valuable. I think it has achieved quite a lot in its own way. It has made a number of states non-nuclear that were hitherto nuclear. I'm thinking South Africa, Argentina, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, 
Um, and it has also provided, as Bill says, a very good forum of, from which people can negotiate and can discuss peaceful opportunities for the future. But I share the frustrations that it hasn't achieved what it should have done in the first place, which is the elimination of nuclear weapons. But we have to work, obviously, to achieve that. And that's why we're having this call today. And that's why we'll be in New York, if that's where it's going to be. Um, in January. What I'd also say is that there is a problem in the world which we haven't raised yet, and that is the non-declared nuclear weapon states that obviously have nuclear weapons, India, Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel. India and Pakistan uh, clearly have nuclear weapons uh, which are directed towards each other, and if ever used would be catastrophic for both sides. And, if you said if India launched a nuclear weapon on Lahore and Pakistan launched a nuclear weapon on Delhi, the millions who would die wouldn't know from which weapon they had died. All they would be just uh, they would just be destroyed by it. So uh, obviously one would push for nuclear disarmament by agreement between India and Pakistan. In the case of North Korea, the six-party talks have had some effect. There is at least an engagement and a discussion uh, with between the USA and North Korea, as well as through the six party talks. I do think they need to be encouraged. And I hope at the NPT Review Congress, there will be an opportunity to say that we want to encourage that process so that North Korea does not take its developments any further forward. At successive NPT Review Conferences, there has been an agreement, that there should be, a nuclear, uh, a weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East, which would obviously include Israel and would obviously include Iran. And I think in passing, one should say we strongly support the principles behind the Iranian nuclear deal and hope that that process continues. But otherwise, the danger is that forces in Iran will push very hard for the development of a nuclear capability. And then we have an even worse arms race uh, within the Middle East. And so, in short, the NPT was a huge step forward in 1968. I think one should pay tribute to those that did it. But I also think it's um, important that there be a realistic um, uh, determination at the review conference to actually ensure that the, the permanent five stick to the word they signed in 2015 and say they actually do support nuclear disarmament. Thank you very much, Jeremy. <clears throat> um, there are some questions from people who are actually on the Zoom call, I think. Um, there was one from, we had fairly early on from Tariq Ralph uh, about the um, possibility of moving the MPT to Vienna. I, I, is Tariq there? No, I could read the question out. Oh, he, yes, he's there. Tarek, would you like to ask your question? Can you hear me now? Yep, yep. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for organizing this meeting and for the discussion thus far. Uh, my question is a little bit off topic, but still related to the NPT. In the earlier uh, discussion today, Ambassador Little pointed out that the UK, uh, along with some others, is supporting uh, bringing to attention the peaceful uses of nuclear technology that have been facilitated uh, through the NPT, and he's entirely correct in, in saying that. So following on from that, since both nuclear verification, something that he has uh, emphasized, and also peaceful uses of nuclear technology are based in Vienna, at the IAEA and also the verification organization for the nuclear test ban treaty is also in Vienna. Would he not support moving the review conference from New York to Vienna as Vienna has more parts of the NPT located there than in New York? Thank you. Thank you. Um, just before we go to Aidan and anyone else who wants to, to tackle that question, I'll just remind people that there are three pillars to the NPT. Uh, one is on nuclear non-proliferation, uh, a second on disarmament, and the third is on the right to peacefully use nuclear technology. And, and I guess it's that third one, the, 
the right to use nuclear technology, which is being referred to here. So, so Aidan, would you like to tackle that one? And then Bill is indicating as well. Oh, Bill has, Bill has to go. Okay. I do apologise, but um, as I mentioned earlier, I thought there would be a vote coming up and we've had the, the bell now, so I do have to go. Uh, thanks very much, Dave, and thanks to Ian, uh, Jeremy, Rebecca, Aidan, um, thanks very much to everybody. We're not going to agree on everything all the time, but at least we're all thinking about important issues. Um, and thank you for having us. It was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. Um, Parliament must go on. <laughs> So, um, Aidan, over, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And um, I mean, Bill's gone now, but but he's, he's absolutely right about that, of course. Um, yeah, uh, just briefly, I mean, Dave, you mentioned peaceful uses. In fact, uh, of course, Vienna is also the home to the um, IAEA, which is uh, has a very important role under Pillar 2, the um, uh, non-proliferation uh, pillar with uh, with regard to uh, safeguards and uh, and so on. Um, I mean, very briefly to Tarek, I, I don't really mind where it's held, to be honest. Um, Vienna's closer to Geneva, so, uh, so that's uh, it's a bit easier to get home for my family. But uh, I, I think, to be honest, um, you know, the important thing is that uh, as many states parties can take part as possible and that we have the right expertise in the room to have a really good conversation and to, uh, and to try and work these issues through. Um, whether it happens uh, in Vienna or Geneva or New York, um, it's, it's all the same to me. Um, have, uh, have, have briefing pack, will travel. Thanks. Anybody else want to chip in on that one? Or shall we move on to another, uh, another person who I think is on the Zoom call David Lowry, he's actually put in a number of different questions, um, but perhaps he could ask the one or one of them that uh, that he feels is more um, uh, more relevant to all the panelists. I think, in particular, he has one about the a number of, the amount of plutonium that's stockpiled at Sellafield um, and what will happen to that. But uh, David, are you, are you there? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. You can. All right. I'll read you my question. These are uh, to the ambassador. Um, three points. Is it possible for the United Kingdom government to take possession at any time of, of any amount of the 139,000 kilograms of so-called civil plutonium stockpile at Sellafield? and remove it from safeguards and to redeploy it to warhead use if Britain had already signed the fissile ban? That's one question. The second question is this. Can Ambassador Little name a single nuclear warhead that has been withdrawn from operational service as a result of multilateral disarmament negotiations in any of the 50 years since the NPT came into force? Is it not true the only warheads that have been withdrawn have been done so unilaterally? And the third question is this to the ambassador. Has the ambassador ever read the negotiating record commitments made by the UK disarmament minister Mully, Fred Mully, to the NPT negotiations uh, in January of 1968? And what the UK meant by, in quotes, in good faith and in quotes, at an early date in Article 6. At an early date was not envisaged to be beyond 50 years that, beyond that time and still the government of, of the day is still finding it's not an appropriate time to begin multilateral nuclear disarmament negotiations. In my view, the UK, United Kingdom has shown gross bad faith in trying to implement NPT Article 6, has not taken the at an early date seriously at all, and has certainly not taken in good faith pro appropriately. Could you give a comment to all three questions, please? Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, so on, on, on the question of plutonium, I mean, the simple answer, it would, dep it would depend on what the treaty says. I mean, there isn't an FMCT there. There's lots of ideas of elements that it could include. Um, but I mean, the, the, the basic idea is that an FMCT would obviously have to be verifiable. Now, there's a question about whether it would include um, stockpiles that have already been built up or whether it would only be uh, about future production. And that's obviously one of the big dividing lines between uh, between uh, negotiating partners at the moment. That's one of the things that's stopping us uh, entering into negotiations because some countries want to want to have that as a condition for negotiation rather than as a question for uh, for the negotiations themselves. Um, so it's, it's, it's an impossible question to answer because it would depend on what treaty we negotiate. But um, uh, but the question of, of, of the 
status of existing stockpiles is, is, is obviously a key, uh, a key factor for that negotiation. Um, the second question on, on warheads. Um, I mean, the, the, the point about the NPT, as we, as we were just saying, um, uh, with regards to what Rebecca said, is, is it's a framework treaty. It's not the, it's not the, uh, it's, it's not the means by which uh, multilateral nuclear disarmament will happen, but it's, it provides the pathway. And the individual steps along that road have to be negotiated um, in, in, in succession. That was why we did the, the CTBT. That's why uh, there were partial test bans before that. Uh, and that's why we say that the FMCT is, is, is an important next step. Now, um, the, the reductions that have happened, yes, a lot of them have been unilateral. Most of them actually have been bilateral or plurilateral um, in the arms control uh, treaties between the US and the Soviet Union and then the Russian Federation. The vast majority of nuclear weapons, deployed nuclear weapons that have been dismantled, uh, have been as a result of uh, bilateral arms control treaties. And again, that's a perfectly valid way of, 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 uh, of implementing um, commitments under Article 6. Um, so um, the, the, the question of a sort of a, a, a final uh, multilateral deal is absolutely a, an important one. But our, our contention, of course, with the TPNW is that's a multilateral treaty and that won't um, get rid of any nuclear warheads either because none of the nuclear weapon states are party to it. So, um, you know, the, 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 this is a step by step process and the multilateral bit um, comes comes later. Um, on, on, on the question of, uh, of, of, of the UK negotiation record. Yes, of course. Um, what, what we meant by an early date in 1968, um, you know, the future was unknowable in 1968, just as it's unknowable today. Um, I would I would strongly refute the argument that we've uh, that we've shown bad faith. I, I, I gave a, a, a suggestion earlier about all the steps that we've taken over the last fifty years to put that legal obligation into action, and we we, we still we we still work hard to do that. So uh, um, I, I strongly reject the uh, the assertion that that's, uh, that we've acted in bad faith. It's it's anything anything but. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, we also have a, a question from somebody who's on the Zoom call, Zia Mian. Uh, could you put your question, please, Zia? Thank you. Um, so my question was aimed at um, all the presenters, and it takes off on the observation made by Ambassador Little about the NPT being a framework within which other steps have purpose and contribute to the goals of Article 6. So could the presenters comment on the implications for the NPT as this framework and for other existing and future international legal obligations on nuclear arms control and disarmament of the US withdrawal from arms control treaties, including the anti-ballistic missile treaty, the Iran deal, the INF treaty, its failure to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and now we read about preparations in the United States to withdraw from the Open Skies Treaty. What does this set of developments mean for this approach of the NPT as a framework for multinational negotiations that allow for what had been previously assumed to be a slow, steady, step-by-step, -step, but irreversible process leading towards fulfillment of NPT Article 6. Thank you. Um, who wants to tackle that first? Can I ask uh, Rebecca, would you like to comment on that? Sure, that's a, a very pertinent, very difficult question um, because we're talking about the framework of laws that have enabled the step-by-steps to move forward Sometimes they have also moved back and then they've moved forward again. And we've kept every time there was uh, something that was very negative, we try to reinforce. So when, you know, church, France was doing its, its, its um, you know, atmospheric nuclear testing in the Pacific in violation of the partial test ban treaty, what we had to do, New Zealand and Australia actually took France to court, despite the fact that France had not actually signed the partial test ban treaty. Meanwhile, civil society and a lot of governments redoubled efforts to really pin down and underpin and, and strengthen the, the, the test ban, of 1963 with a comprehensive test ban treaty. And indeed by 1994, France and China were around the table in negotiating that, um, that treaty. 
and we have to sort of see how how these things you know interconnect so yes you know Zia you're absolutely right that it's 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 horrendous to have a US president or indeed any government leader um, abusing uh, the the international framework of, of laws and the system uh, based on on those the UN system and all the multilateral instruments as part of that by trashing a treaty like the um, uh, INF treaty that you know was a huge part of my early life as a as a former um, Greenham uh, woman down at, at the U.S. nuclear base at Greenham Common in the 1980s, and um, and which provided a really huge measure of the um, environment, if you like, for nuclear disarmament, and indeed, in fact, for the ending of the Cold War um, through stabilizing relations in Europe, losing the INF Treaty, or rather having the INF Treaty taken from us. And let's not forget the role that also Putin played, with Putin and, and Trump really collaborating on that one. Uh, but then Trump went, uh, went on and trashed the JCPOA that others have, have mentioned that you know, involved, you know, all the five, uh, and in this case, definitely would say the permanent um, members of the Security Council, plus the European Union and, and Germany in particular from that, uh, and Iran, in trying to control and limit um, the, the, the nuclear program of Iran, which after all was, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that Iran could call on the NPT Article 4 to justify. Now, how we, we, we do this looking forward is, you know, the fact that criminals commit or, you know, crimes against our own national laws doesn't mean that we decide that we can't live in, in, in the, under the rule of law in our own countries, nor should it mean that we cannot keep building on and reinforcing and living under the rule of law internationally, because that's what we actually need to do. So the, the and here then I, I, I do bring in the, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and, and Tarek, by the way, if you're still listening, I think perhaps the uh, uh, first meeting of states parties um, where, uh, when the TPNW enters into force can take place in Vienna because we need to make the connections with the CTPTO and IAEA and uh, the uh, verification systems that are centered there. And we need to make it accessible to all the countries of the world to be able to participate in that negotiate, in, in how that goes forward. The fact that nuclear armed states have not yet signed the TPNW does not, by the way, I think, and I contradict um, Ambassador Little for suggesting that the, 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 the treaty doesn't have relevance for them, you will see as it enters into force, it'll have more and more relevance in terms of, of how uh, both the stigmatization of nuclear weapons and the inability of nuclear armed states to keep on financing their, their nuclear weapons, developing, modernizing, etc. And I think the whole way in which security is now being looked at also actually feeds into and reinforces a sense around the world that we need to ban and eliminate nuclear weapons. And it has to be a, 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 a treaty law that applies to all states equally, to the, the nuclear armed states, the nuclear endorsing or, or umbrella states, if you want to call them that, and the non-nuclear states, they all have a role to play in that international rule of law that no matter what Trump does, the people of the United States and the people of the world and the people of the nuclear armed and non-nuclear countries actually have to uh, hold fast to and find different ways to reinforce the elimination under those treaties, the elimination and controls uh, of nuclear weapons until they are elim eliminated under those treaties. Um, that process cannot be stopped by one, you know, narcissistic uh, and somewhat crazy leader of whatever state. Forgot to unmute myself. Um, anybody, Jeremy, would you like to come in on that? Very, very briefly. Thanks for the questions here. Um, 
As Dave pointed out earlier, the three pillars behind the NPT are important and we should recognise those as being the basis of what we're doing. I also think that this framework of the NPT is something that's extremely valuable and uh, politics moves on very quickly at some times and uh, I would hope that post-Covid there will be a greater understanding of the interdependence of all of us to each other. And uh, when the sanctions against Iran were, in a sense, broken by the EU itself, and I don't, it's no criticism of the EU, quite the opposite, in that they um, provided support for Iran to deal with the um, corona crisis, well done them. And it shows that um, out of both... Um, uh, self-interest as well as generosity, people should be supporting each other in this in this time. Whether this will lead to changes in the US is an interesting one. Trump has uh, had a great deal to say on many subjects, but he did actually um, meet the North Koreans. And um, if anybody had asked in uh, Trump's election campaign, is Trump likely to meet the North Korean leader? I think everybody would say, well, that was utterly impossible. He actually has met um, Kim Jong twice, and, and I think that is good. Uh, that's not to take away any criticism of, of anybody, uh, but I think it's important that those meetings take place. So it's possible that attitudes in the US will change as well. But don't underestimate the um, financial cost of the lockdown on the major industrial countries. Um, I couldn't give you an exact figure of how much Britain has so far spent on the, on the lockdown, but I would wager it's already in excess of the annual defense budget for this year. The amount of money that's been provided in support to companies, support to local authorities, support to individual workers through the furlough scheme, and so on. It is absolutely massive, and it's going to rise even more uh, when, the, when the lockdown ends. And the same applies to every European country. The uh, economic impact on China has been huge, and I suspect the economic impact on the USA will be absolutely enormous, as levels of unemployment are likely to rise in May. So I think there might just be a realization that rearmament programs are incredibly expensive, uh, as well as um, against, if, in it were, when, if nuclear weapons are involved in it, against the whole spirit behind the NPT. And I think we, we should pay some tribute to those that negotiated the NPT in the first place and um, be prepared to assert very strongly those principles in the review conference that's coming up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, I think we're... We're running out of time a little bit. Um, did you want to mention something, Aidan? Go ahead. Yeah, just, just very briefly. I mean, I, I, I won't go into this in, in much detail, but I, I just coming back to Zia's question about the various treaties. Um, I mean, obviously, we you know we differ with the US on the JCPOA, and uh, uh, and, and, and that's that's well known. But I think just on INF, it's it, we 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 can't fall into the trap of just sort of blaming the US for for trashing a treaty, as was said earlier. The reason the US withdrew from the INF um, is because of something that was actually raised under the Obama administration, which was a violation by the Russians, a deployment of a weapon banned under that treaty. Um, and, you know, NATO countries agreed that there's no point in being part of a treaty which one side is violating um, uh, and, and, this, and still expecting the other side to be, to be bound by. So, I mean, this comes back to the importance of verification I was saying earlier. There is absolutely... Um, you know, it, it is absolutely crucial that any treaty you enter into is respected by both sides and verifiably respected by both sides. And, uh, you know, when one country is, 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 is deploying a banned weapon, uh, it's, it's, I think, uh, um, extremely um, optimistic to think that the other party is just going to turn the other cheek and say, well, that's all right, we'll, uh, we'll carry on as if, as if nothing's happened. Thanks. Thank you. Um, as I say, I was going to say, we, we're running a little bit uh, out of time. We did say we'd finish by uh, 5.30, I think, but we can uh, carry on a little bit over that, perhaps. There are two particular questions to it. Oh, Col Jeremy, yeah, do you have to go? Hey, uh, Dave, thanks for that. J just to say, I have to finish at uh, 5.30 because my life is a series of Zoom calls, and I've got two more coming up after that this evening, so I need to okay. go on through those. So I do have to go at 5.30. Okay, 
But in that case, I wonder if I could uh, put, I think Jackie Burke is, uh, is on the list somewhere. She has a question basically about campaigning. What can we do uh, to, to help the situation? So Jackie, do you want to put your question? Um, hi, yeah, thank, thanks Dave. Um, I'm um, one of the workers at Greater Manchester and District CND. Um, and what I want to talk about is what grassroots campaigners can be doing during um, lockdown to support the MPC um, and nuclear disarmament in general. Um, and also the um, CLPs are not meeting at the moment. So how do we encourage anti-nuclear political education um, if we are CND members and also Labour Party members, or obviously just interested and um, concerned Labour Party members. Thank you. Right. Uh, Dave. Yeah, go ahead, Jerry. Yes, thanks, Dave. Um, Jackie, thanks very much for your question. Uh, I've found this lockdown process really interesting in lots of ways. Of course, for those suffering from COVID, it is appalling. And the stress levels in care workers, cleaners, hospital workers are absolutely huge. There's also an interesting effect in the community in that uh, I've noticed people are much more aware of their neighbors, their friends, much more aware of their community than they ever were before. And I've been um, volunteering in a lot of local food banks over the past few weeks. And it's very interesting, the huge range of people that turn up and have lots of conversations at, I hasten to say, two metre intervals. Um, but they do have conversations about the nature of society and the nature of the world itself. And so I do think it's important that we recognise that we can communicate with each other in a way that we're doing this afternoon through Zoom and through Facebook Live and all, and all the other things. And I've probably spoken to larger meetings than normal, merely from either my office, which is where I am now, or at home, because we've got this technology available. And so I urge you to work with all the grassroots organizations in getting that debate going. And if you have set up your own, and just invite everybody to join in so that they, um, and have this discussion about the role of nuclear weapons, the role of the NPT and the possibilities of longer term disarmament and a um, international strategy, which is the one I've always advocated, which is based on peace, democracy and human rights. And um, do that campaign uh, work because uh, there is a thirst for it. I know that um, Labour Party meetings are not taking place at the moment, uh, although there are quite a lot of constituencies doing informal meetings where large numbers of members join in. I mean, my own constituency has over 4,000 members and we have um, had almost every week a Zoom call in which not all, but a very large number of members have joined in. It's been a really interesting discussion. And on May Day, on, on Friday, I'll be taking part in the international session on May Day, which is being organized through um, on Facebook Live and a number of other other groups and I'm also speaking to Manchester Trades Council's uh, May Day rally on Saturday um, again all without going anywhere other than looking into my mobile phone and making those calls. The technology we've got at our disposal which is affordable and effective is absolutely incredible as a way of reaching people in a way that uh, previous generations never had. We can talk to millions uh, by pressing a few buttons and that is incredible so let's do that. And, f and, and form that debate. And when I put my submission to the uh, Strategic Defence and Security Review, um, I'm putting a, a view forward, which I outlined when I spoke at the very beginning, but I'd be interested to hear the views of many others who would um, want to make comments, obviously put their own submissions in, but I'd be interested in reading everybody else's submissions as well. Let's make this a public debate about the nature of security, the nature of peace, and the nature of dependence on each other, and build a world that actually does care for each other rather than does nothing about those millions living in refugee camps or uh, ignores uh, the grotesque inequality of life expectancy between the wealthier countries and the poorest countries, or between the wealthiest people and the poorest people in both the wealthy as well as the poorer countries. Uh, uh. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. 
Um, I, you, if you have to go, then please do go. But I think Rebecca has indicated she'd like. I'll, I'll, I'll hear Rebecca, then I'll go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jeremy. Well, I'm very glad to follow you. Um, and your final point is is, is very well taken. Um, I I know that the Greens also are putting in um, uh, something uh, on, you know, for the for the for the UK Security and Defence. Um, inquiry and XRP, Extinction Rebellion, uh, the, the piece is going to be, and I think there are very Scottish uh, organisations are planning to be, and I think I agree with you that I think this is a way to get a number of different kinds of perspectives that are connecting the dots. But beyond that, and thank you very much for this question, Jackie, um, you know, Manchester, as you know, has played a really important role in actually raising awareness, uh, moving from the nuclear free local authority kind of approach uh, to, to obviously being, being um, representing mayors for peace in the UK and raising awareness of what uh, city councils and, uh, you know, politicians, parliamentarians and, and um, uh, other kinds of, of, of municipally, you know, elected representatives, uh, how civil society and those representatives can play an, a very, very important role, for example, in aligning themselves or signing up to saying that they, to the extent possible, wish to implement, uh, you know, the, the NPT Article 6 and 1 and 2, implement the tr Treaty on the Pro Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, and this is happening more and more around the world um, through the ICANN Cities Appeal, through the Parliamentary Pledge, through, um, uh, you know, all kinds of different initiatives. Then another thing that, 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 that ICANN has been doing quite a bit of is looking at how much money is being spent annually on nuclear weapons by various nuclear armed states and then comparing that looking at how many beds in intensive care ventilators nurses doctors um, uh, PPE for for you know health and care workers could be resourced for that kind of of, of, of money that's at the moment being spent on uh, just you know the wrong answer at the wrong time for for any anybody's security which is of course, nuclear weapons, uh, then let's recognize we've got various milestones still coming up. It is the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August. We don't know if the lockdown is going to be lifted in this country, but there's a lot of ways in which we can work with ideas like the shadows left on the walls there, the peace crane um, that um, little Sadako kept trying to fold a thousand peace cranes uh, but died before she was able to do that and children all over the world and people all over the world have been carrying on as a way to say not only um, you know that nuclear weapons uh, must never be used but linking that with we need our governments to join the treaty and actually start working within the legal frameworks that now exist to um, to take the right steps, to take the steps towards disinvesting in nuclear weapons. Don't bank on the bomb. Another initiative, um, uh, ICANN initiative originally taken on by PAX, which is an ICANN partner um, in the Netherlands and taken up all over the world now increasingly with companies, with banks, with those that profit from making nuclear weapons rather than from the health and security of the people in the countries in which they operate. So there are actually quite a lot, I mean, 7.2 million pounds being spent annually. Um, sorry, I'm uh, just going to look at 77.2 billion UK pounds, excuse me, um, annually um, just on, on UK nuclear weapons is madness when we are facing the kinds of existential threats of climate destruction and climate chaos and of, of this pandemic. So I think, you know, th there's plenty of things that can be done and the grassroots need to engage using the technologies that we have, communicating with each other and communicating with all of the elected representatives from whichever parties they come.
Thank you very much, Rebecca. Final word to you, Aidan Little, and uh, then I think we have to go. We're losing our panelists and we're losing the, the viewers as well. So. <laughs> Well, I hope I don't drive any more away, but I, I, I obviously can't comment on the on the original question. It's not, not my place to do so, but I just wanted to pick up a couple of points that Rebecca made. Um, just because there's, the, I've seen a lot sort of flying around um, over the last few weeks about this this idea about sort of, um, you know, how many, how many face masks could you buy for the price of a nuclear weapon? I mean, the, the, these sorts of false comparisons, I don't think really do justice to the seriousness of the debate. I think, you know, the, as, as Jeremy said earlier, you know, we have a range of threats that we deal with, you know, governments need to need to deal with all sorts of threats to people's uh, physical, mental and, 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 and uh, human security. Um, nuclear weapons are the answer to one particular threat that we faced in our national security policy. They are not, of course, the answer to threats that we face from climate change or COVID. There are other tools that we need to um, deploy against those threats. The point is that we need to look at all threats. Uh, and we need to apply, apply the tools in collaboration with others that, 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 uh, that meet those threats. It's not a question of saying, well, you know, if, you, if you're spending money on this, you can't spend it on that. As Jeremy said earlier, we've, 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 we've managed to spend an enormous amount of money in a very short amount of time uh, on ventilators and PPE and that sort of thing. Um, the problem with that has not been the amount of money we're spending on it, it's been the supply and, and the logistics of getting them. So I, I, I just think, you know, I, 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 I appreciate the point you're making, um, but it's, uh, I, I'm not sure it's actually a helpful way of thinking think, about it. I think we should understand that those are com campaigning comparisons, but what we are saying is we need to be looking in the right direction at all relevant threats. Absolutely. And using weapons that actually increase the risks and threats on us all and frankly i'm not a political asset let alone any other kind of security asset well i, I agree with the first bit we need to be looking at all of these things and that's what the uh, that's what the security and defense review and now the integrated review will will do um but i think uh, closing our eyes to one threat just because we think it's it's one that's gone is is a very dangerous thing and that's what uh, that's what got us into trouble in the first half of the 20th century well, okay. I, I think we probably will agree to disagree on some of those points, um, but it's always useful and important that we hear other viewpoints and understand what other people are saying and uh, whether we agree with them or not. So uh, thank you very much for, for coming along and taking part. Well, you didn't come along anyway, did you? You, <laughs> you were there. Uh, but thanks very much for taking part. Thanks to Rebecca too and to the other panellists who had to go. Um, I also want to thank Ian Chamberlain, who you've seen his name on the on the uh, screen there, probably, but not his face. He's been just kind of making sure. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> He's making sure that things are, are working well in the background with all the technical stuff. So um, I'm really sorry we didn't get to ask all of the questions. I know there was many of you who were very keen to get questions asked. We had, did in the end. You all warmed up and sent in loads of questions, but we just didn't have the time. So. Thank you for participating. Keep those questions rolling in, if not to us, then to others who, uh, who you should be directing them to as well. And um, basically, let's keep on the campaign. I think the one thing we all agree with is that we've got to get rid of nuclear weapons. Um, let's try and do it as fast as we can before they get rid of us. So thank you very much again, and uh, see you, you again sometime, I hope.